Okay, so we'll just start. Let's see the recording is uh, is started. Um, so today we'll be looking into data engineering, what it is, and just uh, just basically understanding data engineering. As you have seen, this week's challenge is uh, yeah, it's mainly about this uh, agriculture soil data, but uh, overall it's just around uh, data engineering and its concept. So. Before I start, I'll start, start presenting in a few. Maybe I can get uh, from the class what we think, uh, what if we've heard of data engineering, what is data engineering? Let's just start there. Anyone from the class can share us with what you've heard about data engineering, what you think it is. Anyone? Can you hear me, guys? Before, because I start calling out names. Michael, Michael, speak up, speak up. Cover, so you can hear me. Michael, Michael, speak up. Tell us what's the engineer. Oh, okay. So I think I'll just call out names. Let's go to Hewan. Tell me what you know about data engineering. Anything you've heard about data engineering, Hewan? Um, uh, let's just let me just tell you my understanding about it. Um, okay. I think it is. Um, it is about collecting data and um, organizing in such a way that we can use it for um, useful application. I think that's what I think. Okay, thank you, Heron, for that. Maybe just to ask a question, since you've just said it's mainly about collecting data, we've been doing that from from week one, week zero, the collecting data. How is data engineering different from what you've been doing? Um, I think um, we have not collected uh, the data ourselves that was given to us. So I think it's about, it's different in such a way that we ourselves collect the data and um, manage them. Oh, okay. Okay. But I actually think you did collect data. We are actually being given just sources. But at some point, you did involve actually downloading the data itself. That is a form of actually getting the data. So can I get someone else to give me their understanding of uh, data engineering? Without hands, I'll just choose anyone. Yes, Daisy. Um, to add to what Helen has said, I will say that it's basically the process of collecting data from heterogeneous data sources. So this could be like different um, data lakes platform. Um, and in most cases, you're working with um, big data and preparing it for the data scientists to be able to use it to make analysis. Okay, so maybe just one question for you, Daisy. You said in most cases we work with uh, big data. Does that mean when we talk of data engineering, we only work with a uh, big data kind of uh, data? As in, can't we just do it with like, uh, let me say, 4 GB of data and create and do an entire data engineering process? Oh, sorry, I think we still can do it with small data sets. Okay, thank you, Daisy. Maybe I'll just pick one more person before I start the presentation. And um, Kevin, Kevin, what's your understanding of data engineering? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Yeah, like in data engineer, on my perspective, I think he's someone whose job is to prepare data for analytical or any other operation uses. Okay. Okay, what's the difference between a data engineer and the data scientist, Kevin? I think the 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 big difference is that the data, the data engineer, the role of data engineer is to bring the organized data to the data scientist so that it can be analyzed or building some models from those that are generated by data engineer. 
Okay, okay. Thank you, Kevin. I see Ken has something to add on. Ken? My understanding of our data engineer, you know, right now, data exists in different forms and different formats. And these formats are complex and difficult to use. So I, I think the task yeah. of our data engineer is first to get this data in different format, prepare it into a format that can be easy to use by other people. Okay, thank you, Ken, for that. So I see all of us have a certain idea of what data engineering is about. And just as uh, they have uh, all said, it's mainly about just acquiring that data. So many things make data engineering an entire career, an entire concept, but uh, the main idea behind data engineering is actually getting that data. So I'll just uh, start the 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 presentation just a minute okay i hope you can see my screen now i know i can see it so i i do hope you can also see it just a confirmation from one person Okay, Biruk, thank you. So, as I've said, we'll be looking into data engineering. Oh. We'll be looking into data engineering and some of the main things that make this uh, actually an entire concept in, uh, the, let me say, the data space. And uh, I just hope you understand. If you have any questions, just stop me and then we can tackle the questions. So I'll just start with the background. Why, why exactly do we need data engineering? How has it been before? Because data engineering is actually, I can say it's a field that started uh, in early 20. 2010. So I'm thinking somewhere 2011. I'm not sure, but 2011 is where this uh, concept actually came up. And uh, there was actually need to make this an entire career, an entire work on its own. And over the years, it has actually increased because of uh, so many reasons. We'll just look into them. So as you all know, from week one, from everywhere, if you've been working with machine learning or anything, the data is at the center of everything we actually do. You, from week zero, we've been dealing with different kinds of uh, business concepts, business understanding, different kind of businesses. And in every week, we had a certain type of data to actually understand or help us drive our project. And so that's why here I'm saying that data, it's at the center of every business today. And companies use this data to understand various questions like, these days, because I know companies collect data almost almost in every single step, and they may might want to know, like for example, when we were doing the sales forecasting for the pharmaceutical Rossmann Pharmaceuticals, and we wanted to understand this data and actually know how do our customers behave, what can we say about next week, and uh, that's why we are saying that data is actually at the center of these different businesses. We've seen here yeah, the pharmaceutical industry. This week we'll be looking at the agriculture industry and um, so like last week we didn't do something specific on data but we did a project for an academy so just for that you can say even the education industry uses data and uh, i don't know we've also done a telecommunication industry kind of data so it's actually in every every business today and just like i've said in most organizations uh people use different systems no i've not said this but people use different systems to generate their data and store them and sometimes even different technologies so you might find maybe in my local company we are not as many we use excel you might find maybe another it's a small company but not too small so maybe they use some form of relational database, maybe a Microsoft SQL or something. And then you might find the big companies and maybe they're using some form of cloud storage. So each and every company just has its own technologies and they just use different systems to just generate their data and actually store their data. So 
when we mix all this data, you might actually find, for example, in a company which has a sales department, marketing department, customer service department, and each department you might find they're using different systems. Each department is storing different data. So together we can actually combine this data, what's happening in the sales department, what's happening in the customer service department. We could actually combine this data and get something meaningful to help the entire company as a whole. But now the problem is that this data is in different systems, in different technologies, in different, it's just different data. Yet together we could actually get something more meaningful. And that's where data engineering comes in. So what data engineering does is that it creates an interface where we can get all this form of data from different types of, different types of systems, different types of technologies, just data from everywhere it could be raw it could be structured it could be unstructured and then we get all this form of data through these interfaces and then we create now one single information with something that is actually knowledgeable that's what data engineering is basically about and what it does is that we make this data more reliable we create it more faster make it more secure and uh, we're doing this we're doing this now for our consumers what you can see consumers of data in terms of as a data engineer the people who will consume the data we are preparing now become the data analysts the data scientists the machine machine learning engineers and maybe even in maybe small cases like companies the executive in those companies so to do this what data engineering mainly involves is sourcing the data transforming that data and doing some form of analysis it could not, it could be small just minor or major like for example this week we are doing some form of just transformation something just basic to the data so that it can actually be understood by the next track of consumers and um this is now just a basic uh, drawing of what happens in data engineering we have the different technologies like i've said this could be the sales department with their data in excel this could be i don't know something who put their data in microsoft sql server here we could have someone else doing it in uh in our cloud service like the amazon s3 and so many different areas then data engineering combines all of them and then you put it in a method that the analyst and the data scientist can understand it. So up to there, have we understood? Do we have uh, any question? Okay, so I'll just assume we've understood. Um, I'll come up with questions to ask in the middle of the class and at the end. So I'll just ask anyone. I'm hoping that everyone is uh, listening. So the next question we ask ourselves, now that we know what data engineering is, why why are we doing a data engineering? Yeah, so like I've said, this is an, an industry that actually came up around uh, 2011, and it's because of these big big companies that have big data, like Amazon, like, like Airbnb, these big companies. You, can, you, you will also find some frameworks we use in data engineering actually came from these big companies because they realized we have too much data and so we need to find someone else, the data engineer to actually deal with this data, come up with this complete new concept called data engineering. And so when we ask ourselves why, why data engineering, one of the main reasons is because there's more data than ever before. I was just reading a source today and uh, I'll just quote it. I'm not sure if it's the truth, but apparently 90% of the data we have today, we can say, was collected from just the past two years. That's because the more we've realized that the data is actually important, the more it's being collected. These days, we collect every kind of information, where you live, what you eat. Even I know when they're doing recommender systems in Netflix and YouTube, they use data. What are you watching? And everything. So there's more data in the current, in today, today than ever before. So secondly, why we need data engineering? It's because data is becoming more valuable to companies and business functions like decision making. You'll find that today we have a lot more data driven decisions than, let me say, intuition or just, just to date, the decisions are mainly done because of data. That's why you might even find a company that's just a bank, but they have data analysts, data scientists, because 
decisions these days are done with data. And uh, some of the uh, something else where we need data engineering is that now because we figure out that data can actually help us increase maybe our customers. And so these companies are finding more ways to benefit from data. And it could be maybe just understanding how is the business doing at the moment. Just from looking at the data, we can see how the business is doing. We can also predict the future. An example I gave for the Rossman Pharmaceutical Challenge. And uh, I, from looking at historical data, if, for example, if it's a time series data like the Rossman Pharmaceuticals data, then we can do some form of prediction. And then we also have other functions like the customer modeling, preventing threats and creating new products. So, and then finally, why we need data engineering? We might find that this data, the more it continues to grow, the more it continues to become complex. And uh, I could say, so far, I think what we are handling this week, uh, apart from the speech data, we could actually say that this is another form of uh, complex data, something to do with the soil data, satellite data, climate data. And as this data becomes more complex and gets different formats, data engineering continues to grow in importance because now we will need to actually standardize and transform all this data into something that can actually just be used for analysis and uh, yeah, so that's the one of the main reasons why we need data engineering today. So I'll just go into a few of the main responsibilities of data engineering. Something that as a data engineer you'll be doing uh, often and we have like maybe gathering data requirements. And uh, like this week, we know we are using uh, gathering data requirements. So we are using um, soil data but then what you do as a data engineer is to, okay i'm preparing this i'm preparing this uh how can i say this we are doing a python package i'm doing this python package so this specific data who will who will who will use it and uh why do they need to use it and uh, maybe what kind of structure will they easily understand so that is basically just gathering the data requirements why do they need this data so that when you're actually collecting this data, you can give it to them in a form that they understand. Uh, if I remember correctly, we had this class last week about um, front end. And when you're thinking about a user design, you're thinking about how will the user use it. And that is exactly what we do in data requirements. How will the user use this data? And then now you tailor your pipeline into what the requirements are. Something else that uh, a responsibility of a data engineer is uh, maintaining the metadata. And uh, what metadata is, is just basically additional information. We did this in the speech recognition challenge. And uh, this could, like for example, for that data, we just had data that was just audio and it was just audio. But then using Librosa, we did What's the duration of that audio? What's the sample rate of that audio? So such kind of things are what we call the metadata. And most of this will actually be generated during the transformation process. And uh, other additions I've added there, like we have the schema of that data, the size of that data. Since you've said we'll be sourcing it from different areas, it could also be what the technology that was used to collect that data. Just so many metadata that could actually help inform, inform the analysis. Then next we have ensuring security and governance of the data. And this could, inf could involve things like encrypting the data, maybe auditing who will have access to the data, maybe using some form of centralized security control, and just any other form you can use uh, to secure your data. Then we have storing data. And uh, this will come depending on your data. Maybe it's, if it's small data, you might just need to use a relational database. If uh, maybe it is big data, you might find the need to use things like Hadoop and Amazon S3 and uh, just yeah, just storing the data. After doing all the processes we need in data engineering, you do need to store the data in a way that the data analysts and scientists can easily access it. And then finally, but not least, we have the processing data. And this is now where we have the transformations going on and reaching of that data, summarizing that data into some, something the consumers can understand. So these responsibilities are tied with the tasks of a data engineer. 
and uh, in tasks, we can just broadly classify them into these five. We have acquisition, this is acquisition of data. We have cleansing, which is correcting errors. You've done this in EDA before, cleaning the data, just checking the outliers, dropping those outliers. We have the conversion, converting from one format to another. Example, again, I'll use the speech recognition data. We did do some form of conversion from maybe mono channels to stereo channels. That was also some work for the data engineer. Then we have disambiguation, which is the interpreting data that has multiple meanings multiple meanings and then we have finally the deduplication which is just removing duplicate copies of data so do we have any question up there on the responsibilities and tasks of data engineering and data engineer yes is that a hand that had something has someone raised their hands they can just go ahead uh, okay, um, I've raised my hand. I wanted to ask, based on these responsibilities, it means that the data scientists now get to get data that's cleaned. And uh, no, my question is, ideally, data scientists don't clean data like while working. Is that the question? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so at the moment, because of the introduction of data engineering, data scientists, they don't deal with cleaning anymore. You might find, you might be in a company where, where you are the data scientist, but there is no data engineer. So you might find yourself doing the data engineering, the EDA. But if your company has the privilege and the access to data, a data engineer, they will be doing all this work, sourcing the data, cleaning it. Basically, I think everything we do in EDA, but with data engineering, we now introduce other concepts like automation, where we have these processes maybe running every two hours, every, every one week, we just have the same processes running so that we ensure we have the data all the time. Okay, that, thank you. Okay. So do we have any question? Any other question? Any other question? Okay, so I'll continue. So what we've uh, has kept recurring is that the collection of data from different sources. And it's good to understand these different type of sources that you might actually have in data engineering. And we have like the common ones. Most of us just know the relational databases, like from, from yeah, as I've said, from MSQL server, from IBM. We also have the MongoDB, which is a, a, GIS, a NoSQL kind of database, a JSON database and we have other so we have uh, some of the common ones here the relational databases the non-relational like the mongo the mongodb json and then we have some that i think you can, you can just look at this i don't know if this is, there would be any question on any of this this is just basically the data source the kind of application that uses this type of data source the data structure mainly used for that data source the interface if you want to access data from a relational database you you'll need to know sql maybe if you need data from a file system maybe like uh, microsoft excel google sheets you might need and a form of api maybe if you need from now the mongodb the json database they have their own specific just kind of like sql but not really sql but that they use to actually access their data so if you're dealing with this kind of data source you might need to learn the language that that specific vendor uses i think it's actually vendor specific and not even uh data so specific when it comes to especially you know for the nosql databases you'll need to learn what mongodb does what dynamo does and different kinds of databases so these are the type of data sources we have i'll just share this if you need more to do more research you can just look into this so next we'll go into the key skills and tools used in data engineering skills in data engineering sorry so when we talk about data engineering like what exactly maybe do you need to learn 
or uh, what exactly happens in data engineering. That's what we'll be talking about. So when dealing with data engineering, one of the main things we'll be hearing a lot is data pipelines. And um, what data pipelines are in data engineering, it's basically just the end-to-end -end process, just from sourcing that data to the form where you put it in another, another form of database, you store it in a way that the analyst and data scientist can understand it. This is just the same, like the same pipeline when they say machine learning pipeline, and it's basically from pre-processing all the way to prediction, just a form of something that follows each other. So when we say data pipelines, what we just talk about is from the moment you will extract that data from one or multiple sources to the point where you will load it maybe to another, to another, to another relational database or maybe a cloud database. So that's what data pipeline means. So within the data pipeline, now this entire end-to-end -end process in data engineering, the data may undergo several steps of transformation, validation, enrich, enrichment, summarization, and just basically anything you can do to data before it's ready. And uh, some of the technologies used in um, in now in within the pipeline we have like the etl tools what etl stands for is extract transform and load and uh, we actually have specific technologies that do the etl extract transform and load like for example we have they have included the informatica and sap and these tools are basically used to do to apply the rules of transformation and maybe cleaning that data when especially when we say transformation this could be the process where we uh, we do cleaning and maybe adding metadata and removing outliers and removing duplicates so many things can happen in transformation maybe normalization scaling everything we've done from equan you can think about we did to data most of them will actually come under transformation and th these tools actually help to do to do that the next thing that is very important in um in data engineering is sql and uh, for example if you you are going to deal with relational databases you really need to know sql to the depth and uh, if you're actually considering to pursue a career in data engineering you can actually check your SQL skills where they are at. I think Aaron had shared, um, I think it was a template on just checking how your SQL skills are. Is it beginning, intermediate, or expert? And you can just, you really need to understand SQL if you're going to do anything with uh, data engineering, a career in data engineering to be specific. But then we only specify SQL because this is a common uh, structured language for relational databases. If you might actually find that you're doing, uh, you're looking for a job and that company uses MongoDB, you might need to actually learn the language that MongoDB uses. I've only added SQL here as a general language used for querying the database, but you might find with different types of vendors, they might have their different specific language. So next we have Python. The, so this is just a programming language that should be used. So I've indicated Python because it's among the popular ones used in data engineering, mainly because it's powerful. It has access to a lot of libraries. You've, you can attest to that. You've been using it. And instead of using the ETL tools I'd mentioned, like Informatica, Python can actually be used to do all the ETL tasks so you don't if you have if you know python you can actually use it to do the etl tasks instead of using the etl tools and it's actually preferred to use python instead of those tools because it's more flexible and uh, it is more powerful so i'm not sure if there's any other r we are, i don't know r is mainly used in data science i'm not sure if it is a main language in data data engineering but i know that knowing python which is actually good because our program focuses on python would actually put you in a deeper understanding of data engineering and better opportunities so other tools i'd uh, like to mention is like spark and hadoop and like daisy had mentioned data engineering also comes in because of big data and anytime we have big data in our small machines that can be troubling most of you know that already. So Spark and Hadoop 
come up as the technologies that can actually be used for big data to actually manipulate this big data. Then we have the HDFS in Amazon S3. I've also added Justice as examples of storage, storing tools. In HDFS, this is Hadoop distributed uh, file systems, helps you to when working with Hadoop. And then we have like the Amazon S3, the cloud form of storage. So we could have other additional storages there, like um, just the normal relational database, MySQL. We've done MySQL, Streamlit. There's, is that a database? Yeah. So those are the basic skills and tools used and required in uh, data engineering. So are there questions up to there? Because I, I want to go a little bit deep into other terminologies I've just mentioned. Up to there, do we have any questions? Any questions? So Nahom, Nahom, are we together? Are we together up to there? Nahom. Nahom. Is Nahom on the call? If you're unable to talk, oh, okay. It's better seeing something than keeping quiet because I'll just assume your, your phone or your laptop is on the call, but you're not there, which is not good. So uh, I'll ask Jeremy. Just a hang, not yet, but you will before the end uh, of today, immediately after this class. So Jeremy, Jeremy, are we together up to there so far? Yes. Okay, so can you just summarize the skills I've said? I've said I think four or five skills to are here. Maybe just briefly, the skills and tools you'd need in um, data engineering. Just do briefly, you don't have to say any specific, but you've noticed they're, they're, they're all related to something. So just to summarize it for the rest of us and those who have just joined. Jeremy, talking to you. Can you hear me? Hello. 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 Yes, Jeremy, I can hear you. Can't you hear me? Okay, uh, the skills for the data engineering. Uh, R coding, uh, database systems, uh, uh, communication skills are some of the skills uh, that we need for data engineering. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. You have been a little bit more general. Uh, when you say communication skills, do you have anything specific or relating to something that I have touched when you say communication skills? Uh, not related to your uh, presentation. That's my general idea about the data engine. But uh, related to what you, you taught us, uh, uh, we need like uh, uh, basic understanding of uh, machine learning uh, and uh, understanding the, the data analysis um knowing the technology why, jeremy where would we need to understand data analysis and uh we've said basically what we are doing in data engineering is preparing the data for analysis by the analysts and the scientists so why why, why would you say analysis uh, because we we need to know the form of the data uh, so uh that we can easily change to our uh, preferable output. Oh, okay, I get that. But I think the best way to refer to that would be more of um, transformation. Yes. Yeah. yeah, transformation. Okay, so thank you, Jeremy. Okay. It's good to know you are awake in the class.
So I'll just continue. I'm sorry. Okay, so as I had said before, what mainly happens in data engineering, the end-to-end -end processes, you will, will commonly be referred to as a data pipeline. And um, normally it is an ETL data pipeline, just the normal method, the normal processes that happens in data engineering is the ETL, extract, transform, and then load. And uh, we'll do this basically in data pipeline. Before, because I had mentioned what a data pipeline is, could I have anyone from the group just tell me what a data pipeline is in brief? because I had mentioned it before. Okay, to fire, to fire Alemayehu. What's a data pipeline? Okay, as this fire writes his response on the messages, maybe we could have um, Meron. Meron, tell, tell us what a data pipeline is. Meron, Meron, are you on the call? May I don't say something on the chats or I just speak up. I we, we won't know if you are available if you don't say anything. Then D, D yeah, that's Dynamo. Dynamo is a data pipeline. Did I skip the definition of a data pipeline? Why is uh, everyone quiet? Did I not mention what a data pipeline is? Oops. Could I have anyone speak up? I need to know we are all on the same page before I continue. We've not understood what a data pipeline is. Jonas, today, sir. There's a hand raised, let me see. Biruk, yes, Biruk. Yeah, um, so data pipeline is, uh, is just a means of uh, transforming the data from the source to uh, the target destination, which is actually the data warehouse. And in the meantime, we will go through different transformation and optimization of the data in order to make the data uh, to be easy for analysis and in order to make some kind of uh, useful in insights. Okay, thank you, Baruch and Stella from the chats. So, if I can ask maybe DA, uh, it's, it's DA and Meron. Have you caught that? <laughs> Do we have DA and Meron in, if I just go ahead and remove the both of you from this class, can I assume you are not actively listening and uh, DA and Meron? Okay, we'll look into that later. So I'll just continue with the data pipelines and uh, what they are. So just like Baruch has said, what Stella has typed from the messages, it is basically that end-to-end -end process from extracting the data or sourcing the data to the form of uh, loading it into, into another system, just all this kind of data. So like I've said here, it's basically, it's a set of tools and processes for moving data from one system to another for storage and further handling. So it could be from one storage, like uh, 
a relational database to another relational database, but you could get it from different relational databases, just from different processes. And everything else that happens in the middle, the processes, transforming it, adding metadata to it, Maybe if it was unstructured, making it structured in a way that will be understood. Just everything that happens in the middle layer to the data, that's what we generally define as data pipeline. Okay, DA, I have, I have seen your, your message. Okay, so like I have said, it is what happens mainly in data engineering and constructing these data pipelines is actually the core responsibility of a data engineer and of data engineering uh in general so this is basically just a repetition but what is mainly used for it is moving data from maybe from hate saying from a cloud to a data warehouse but it could be from anywhere you could do it from um from a relational database you could do it from a file is a file the the file kind of database from an excel and then maybe for now we'd actually be targeting a data warehouse but in different instances you might be targeting another type of a data storage we will look into just a few of that in a few the other thing that happens in data pipelining is uh, wrangling data into a single location for convenience in machine learning projects same thing we've said about just collecting the data then we have integrating data from various connected devices and systems uh, to say that copying databases into a cloud data warehouse. So in a case where we want our data to be in the cloud, but we have it locally, so data pipeline could also in, in, involve that movement from the on-premise to the cloud data warehouse. And then we have just bringing the data into one place for BI for BI and other form of analytics. So in BI, what we mainly do is just the analysis, visualization, change of products, this, that I mean, it does not inform any form of machine learning, just understanding what are the, the insights from the data. So that's what we do at uh, BI. Uh, so since I've mentioned uh, ETL data pipeline, I wanted to get a little bit more into, sorry, sorry into ETLs, what exactly it is. And uh, if you've heard of ETLs, I know you've also heard of ELT. And why is it that we use ETL mainly and not ELT? So for those ones who have not heard of ELT, it's just the same meaning, but the process has been, uh, it's not the same. Like we say in ETL is extract, transform and load. While in ELT, it would be extract, load and then transform so we'll i think we'll just touch a little bit into that but for now we need to focus more on etl especially for work like this week we need to do the etl process instead of elt so what etl is is just a pipe it's just the data pipeline infrastructure and it it will vary depending on the use case and your scale and exactly what you need to do especially for the transform so in etl operations i've said we have the extract transform and load and uh, so in extract this is where we have uh, maybe getting data from different databases we can also source data maybe from internet we can source data from our computers locally we can source data from all these locations we can also get historical data you might find companies just dealing with historical data and we can also get historical data then we just extract all this data and get them into one locations where we now do transformation so the main idea of transformation is since you've actually extracted your data from different from different sources, you unify it in a format that can actually be understood by the consumers. That's the analyst and the data scientist. So that's what basically happens in transform, the main idea of transformation. But other things, as I said, you can do in transformations is just adding more features, adding more metadata. Yeah, just examples. And then now loading, this is where now we do to one major data warehouse so Jizaheng, i had seen a question let me just look 
Is it part of EDA? Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we say EDA, EDA is, how can I say this? When we, when I say data engineering, it's mainly what happens in EDA, where we get the data, we understand it, we do some form of cleaning, then now we continue with the other processes. So what happens in EDA is mainly what happens in data engineering. But in addition to EDA, what, what we target in data engineering is now after cleaning, because we won't be continuing to to machine learning or maybe doing some form of B, BI, we now, our end goal is actually to load it into a storage where the analysts and the scientists can actually access it. And again, unlike EDA, you might find me being EDA, we do these processes. The best way I think we can do maybe, we, we do some form of module, uh, some form of object-oriented programming, and maybe you reuse the functions. But in data engineering, we'll, we'll go a little bit deeper and ETL and actually automate this, actually automate these processes. You might, we might actually see that maybe for the historical data, maybe we are getting our data from the USGS, like we are doing uh, this week, and maybe just maybe the upload their data every two weeks. So you might actually need to get the new data every two weeks. And instead of going back and looking, oh, it's it's the 12th of June, it's time to update data. So you can just actually schedule that job to actually be running every two weeks. So when we say ETL, data engineering and EDA, they're mostly related, but data engineering is a little bit more. It's a little bit deeper. Is that clearer, Josiah? Okay. So again, I keep repeating the same the same definitions, but yeah, just extract, transform, and load. Again, just retrieving and coming data, standardizing the data, and uh, saving the data to a new destination. I hope this is clear by now. Honestly, can I get maybe just a show of like five hands that this is clear? What what is it? Okay, we have Baruch, Hewan. Ah, okay, cool, that's more than enough. So I'll just continue and uh, talk a little bit more about a data warehouse, what it is, why do we need it, and uh, just show you the structure, architecture, I'm sorry. So a data warehouse, it's just basically a central repository for the data where we can actually just query, it's easier to query this data, what the data scientists do. They can now query your data warehouse, data that you have collected from different sources, transformed, put it into something central, and then now they can do their queries on that, on that storage. That's what we actually call a data warehouse. So this data warehouse could be as simple as a relational database, that has been optimized to help the query easily, or it could be as complex as, instead of doing it on premise, we do it on a cloud. It does not have to be that when you say data warehouse, it's something specific. It could be your normal MySQL, it, your MySQL database, you could call that a data warehouse. And then in, in big environments like companies, this could be the cloud-based kind of storage. So that's just what's a data warehouse. But even if we do it locally, like the relational databases, it is actually different from a regular database in different way. And uh, just a few of the ways it's like maybe the data structure. And uh, when you are querying uh, from a normal, a regular database, it might actually take use a lot of computing resources because a regular database is just do is stores data in many different tables and just redundancies like you might have for example in case of we have uh, customers maybe we have orders the orders they do maybe we have the purchases they make it's usually different tables just re just how can i say this if you understand relational databases they are just connected, they are related, relational. In, so in maybe 
index keys and um, foreign keys and you just connect them out of the redundancy in the data. And uh, for this case, it might actually take a lot of computing power to query from such kind of a database. But in the case of a data warehouse, this data is combined into one thing and querying this kind of database become a little bit easier. Instead of all those tables, now we just have a few tables with dedicated kind of, this is what this table should do. And eventually just the performance and the analytics of the data warehouse improves in comparison to our regular database. So something else, another way it is different is the type of data. So since the normal relation database is actually just aimed at doing the day-to-day -day transactions, you might find that it really has historical data. But for data warehouse, this is where our main interest is the historical data. So you find that this again, where we, we can say the difference between a data warehouse and a regular type of data database. And then finally, we have, um, this difference where unlike a normal database in a data warehouse it it could actually be tougher to access the database when it's concurrent users because this is mainly because when we do a data warehouse we are targeting maybe like a small group of analysts or business users maybe like just within a company and we have and uh, uh, you didn't, maybe you just have maybe a group of like five five analysts or not not a lot small people. So when you create data warehouse, we have a specific audience in mind, and that's why it actually does not support concurrent users. I'm actually not sure if there is a modern one that can do a lot more concurrent users. This is mainly based on the traditional data warehouse. So maybe I do more research whether we have a um, data warehouse that can support a lot more concurrent users. Okay, so when we look at the architecture of a data warehouse, like we, we this is basically how it looks like. From the data sources, as you had seen in the previous diagram, from the data sources, we do the we do the extraction from the data sources, we do transformation, and then we had finished with load. If you look at the previous, at the previous here, sorry. Here we say load, load into the data warehouse. And so that is basically the structure that comes for the data warehouse. We have all the data that has undergone through it, let me say ENT, because now the loading is where the data warehouse comes in it's stored there and it's basically stored so that we have now it used for maybe reporting, visualization, analytics, maybe for machine learning, for if they need it for that purpose, maybe for decision making, if just in a way that it can easily be accessed by other consumers to do more analysis. Yeah, so it's just basically the architecture for the data warehouse. So when you're constructing a data warehouse, the just, the just four main basic components you'd require. We have the, the storage. So are we doing our DW on premise or are we doing it on the cloud? And then we have the metadata, as I had mentioned, additional data to enrich our data and just make the data to be some form of information or comprehensive knowledge. Then we have the access tools. We've said maybe our data will be used will be used for for analysis for some form of reporting. And then maybe you might actually need it to integrate maybe with Tableau, a form of a BI tool. And then so access tools comes here. So how will they how will the, anal the analysts, the scientists access your data so that they can use it for their desired outcome? Like for example, this week, yes, we are doing that data engineering and you are getting the data, but the access tool we want them to actually get is the Python package. So you do your data engineering and the access tool to access 
your code behind will be now your Python package. They just do pip install, whatever name you give your, your package, all that processes runs in the back end and then just gives them the data that they can use for other things. And then finally, we have the management tools and uh, this, uh, this, because we've said data can also be used for, for actions like decision making, that is where the management tools come. And this could be ranging anywhere from the HR tools where they used to make decisions. We have different kind of systems used for management. So a data warehouse should also be able to, should have a form of tool that they can they can interact with. So like we've said for the access tools, we can have the package with them, they can do a pip install. So in management tool, it's something different. Like um, how I, I think they can also use the Python package, but since that is more, more low level in terms of the developers, I think for management tools, it has to be something way easier, maybe like an, a backend, a backend and then integrating with their frontend. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Should I repeat that? Yes, Biruk. Um, my question is actually on the previous slide. Hello? Okay. So here we have uh, uh, combination of structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data. So, uh, how, how, how we are going to manage this uh, uh, combined form of data? So, uh, are we going to convert everything to a similar format for accessing and analyzing, analysis? Yes, uh, what this architecture shows here is that your data warehouse could be in the form of structured data, semi-structured data or unstructured data. Like I had said, you need to collect the requirements, who will be using our data, in what format will they require it. So if they need it in structured data, everything that you source, if it is structured or unstructured, you will have to transform it into a form that they need, maybe if it is structured data. So during transformation, you can transform everything into structured data then your users can use it. If they need it as an unstructured data, maybe because of what they are doing later on, then when you are collecting your data, whether structured, semi-structured or unstructured, you need to transform it into an unstructured format because that's how they require it. Then when you're storing it, they can access it in, access it in one specific format. So here we have a unified, sorry, where did that go, sorry. Yeah, so you can have a unif, this is just uniform, it's either structured data or semi-structured data or unstructured data, because we need it in one unified form. Is that clear, Berek? Yeah, that explains my question, thank you. Okay, so I think Rehmet said I should uh, redo this part, right? Is it Rehmet? Yeah, so Rahmet, you are asking, should, is it the management tools or just basically when constructing the data warehouse, the basic components? Rahmet. Okay, so I think that means the management tools and as I had said for the access tools, like a good example is what you're doing this week. And after doing all this data accessing and data engineering in the back end, you're expected to come with a Python, to come up with a Python package. Something that an analyst, a data scientist can just say pip install XYZ. And just from that, they get the later data in a specific format that they want, the one that has, is required from this week. So for management tools, I am not quite sure, but what I was thinking, for the past two weeks, we've been doing front-end and back-end. And uh, you might find that there's this front-end tool used for decision-making in a company. And so when you are doing your data warehouse, you need to make it in a way that it can actually interface 
with the front end so that they can get the data without necessarily without necessarily doing the hard work acquiring the data from maybe like usgs this week does that make it clear Rahmat? okay so to answer your question michael yes i the best outcome from a data engineering project would be the data warehouse but then again the additional things we can have like i've said is the access tools the management tools how the analysts will understand your work the python package it could be maybe another form of api for the management tool so Ideally, it's the data warehouse. Let me say some form of data warehouse because depending on your data, the output could be something different, but just some form of storage. Okay, so because of time, I'll just finish up. Finish up. And uh, in addition to data warehouses, which is what I was saying, Michael, you might find there are other storage formats like data mats and data lakes. And data mats is just basically a smaller data warehouse. And this is used in maybe in an in the case where we have um, a small number of people, typically less than 100 GB. So if your data is less than 100 GB, you might be looking into using maybe a data mat. In this architecture we have here, sh just shows how simply we can use a data mat. For example, if you are working with uh, a company that is divided into different departments, we have here department A to C. And you've done your data sourcing, you've done your ETL, your data is already in a data warehouse, but then they don't need it. Different departments need their data for different work. So you might actually separate them into other smaller, simpler data maps. And then they can be accessed individually by different departments for whatever different purpose that they need. And then the opposite of data maps and data warehouse, that's where we have now the data lakes, which uh unlike the data map which is smaller the data lake is much larger and it is mainly used for big data big kind of data something else different you need to note in data lakes uh what you've been using for data house data engineering data maps we've we've been following the etl kind of process you extract transform and then load but then when you come to data lakes, because we'll be, de we'll be dealing with a huge data, big data, this I can see is one of the, why in, in data engineering where you'll actually follow the, the alternative approach where you just extract, you load it into a data lake in different formats, unprocessed formats native, just load it into a data lake and then now do the transformation before it is consumed by the others and with that uh, that will be the end of our lecture sorry our tutorial today <laughs> i felt like i was talking a lot of our tutorial today if there's anyone with any question you can raise them now before we end the tutorial Okay, if there are no questions, I'll just pick another last person randomly to just tell me the processes in an ETL, no, sorry, in data engineering. And for example, if you are talking about this week, about this week, uh, LIDAR data, just say uh, data engineering in terms of this week's challenge. What do you, now from what you've known, what will you be following to actually come up with a successful data engineering project? So with no volunteer, I'll just go ahead and pick someone. Samuel, Samuel Al Ali Ali. Samuel, are you there? Yes, I'm here. I'm safe. Okay, first, how do I say your second name? Is it Aileen? Aileen. Alana. 
It's no problem. Elena. Ah, okay. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so just tell me the basic processes in data engineering and use this week's data as an example. Okay, okay. the basic uh, would be like to prepare the and the data for end users like business groups or data scientists and the main process would be to extract, transform and load that data to a specific warehouse so others can use it another time or another place uh in our in this week challenge i guess we have given a lidar data set it's very big and it's not fully transformed so we will load that data from i think it's stored in the amazon s3 server so we will load that data uh, transform it uh, we will extract it transform it and after that we'll prepare a package to be installed by others that's it. Okay, thank you, Samuel. Uh, maybe just uh, one question to you. When we say transform, it's already been explicitly mentioned in this week's challenge, but what kind of transformation could we do for this week's data? Particularly for this week, I have not depth, I have not looked into depths in the weekly challenge, so it's I'm I'm looking into it, so I can't say for sure what kind of transformation we will particularly use for this data set. Okay, thank you, thank you, Samuel. But if you just look uh, into today into this week's challenge for those who have not seen, there's just uh, I think two or three transformations that you'll be doing this week. Just a way of enriching your data. I think we will be extracting something called uh, what is the TWI? I'm not really sure. I, I, I but you just go and check. So, if there are no other questions, I think we can end the class there, and um, have a good evening. Happy coding.